saying hi to people that i can't see <laughs> uh you can uh you can open the the chat uh the the chat uh room yeah and there so you can read everybody saying hi hello gotcha. from peru from everywhere so you can like have a yep kind of feedback very nice mexico ecuador chile very cool hello hello everybody can you read it all right. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about something that um, was really big and changed my whole perception of the guitar and how I navigate the guitar and how I see the guitar and really how I see uh, music in general and, and the way that I write and everything. There was a big thing that happened to me years ago that changed my whole perspective about um, really the fretboard and how I see it. And so I'm just going to talk about that a little bit. So I don't know if I should wait for somebody. So in, when I was young, I used to play the way that most people play. I mean, you know, I, I did what most people did, which is that I'd hear music and I had a pretty good ear and I could, I didn't really know that much about uh, theory or anything, but I had a good enough ear to be able to tell when uh, I was playing the right pentatonic notes in the song. If a song sounded like this, I knew that that meant I could come up here, I'd find it with my ear, and then I could play things like. So I kind of knew that, and I didn't really know exactly what I was doing, but I knew that these notes were the correct notes. And really, that was. When the home, and this and I would always be listening to other types of guitar players. So I was, you know, I was very influenced by rock. I was a rock player. I still am a rock player. And I started with, you know, uh, Jimmy Page. Like I was starting to listen to people like John Schofield and Pat Metheny and, uh, and then eventually like Scott Henderson and Larry Carlton. And I kept noticing that there was something that they were doing on the guitar uh, with their phrasing and with their note selection that sounded a lot different than what I was doing. And, I, and it was very hard for me to pinpoint or locate exactly what that difference was. And today I want to talk about what, what I finally discovered that was the difference and it really changed everything. And to this day, it's still a huge part of um, my approach to soloing and my approach to improvisation and to, to composition. So as I started to learn a little bit more about music theory, I started to understand that all scales in you know all the sort of western modes were related to one another and so if i had this scale we would call that the dorian mode or we'd call that a minor scale uh, a particular type of minor scale for a and i knew after a while that that meant those are the same notes that i'm playing if i play do re mi fa sol la ti do and g so i knew that those scales were related and then i started to figure out all of the modes and I, and that was that was a good starting point a, a lot of guys figure that out and they realize okay here's another scale the same notes in it and, okay so that made my brain start to operate a little bit because I started to then learn a little bit more about chords and I started to understand that a chord was really comprised of every other note of a scale. Like a G major chord was really every other note of a G major scale, one, three, five, and seven. Or I could play that together um, and get a chord that sounds like that. Um, 
and then that led to me understanding that if I played all the starting points of that chord to the next interval, I would end up getting all the harmonized chords that are diatonic to that key. So the reason that this is important is because if I had a song that's in A minor, like I'll play this, I'll just play something for a second, just a regular A minor groove. Kind of a funk groove. So in the old days, I would have been playing these notes. Oh, wait a That's the old way that I would used to play when I was younger. Right, so then my brain started to work and I started to think, well, if G major is the same thing as A Dorian, and G major brings with it all of these diatonic chords, and so forth, then if I play every one of those chords, with the notes separately, meaning that instead of playing a G major seventh chord, I'll play a G major seventh arpeggio. Then that means that that arpeggio, this is my brain, you know, 30 years ago thinking, that means that this arpeggio should work over this chord. I'm sorry. And it did. It was kind of interesting. I thought, to, you know, suddenly I was playing notes that I wouldn't have thought to play myself. I wouldn't hear that automatically. But I liked the sound of it because it was a lot more colorful and a lot more, um, uh, a lot less predictable sounding. Um, so I started experimenting with just playing these chords in the form of arpeggios over A minor, just to see what would happen. Instead of always playing this, instead, now I'm starting to play things like this. And this is me experimenting back then. So. So here I go, G major. A minor, of course, no, we know that's nice. That's the same thing as pentatonic. B minor. C major. D7, D dominant 7. E minor. The minor 7 flat 5 on F sharp. C major, E, F sharp, G major, B, and so forth. So that was really different for me back then. That, that suddenly I discovered a new, um, sort of a new concept on the guitar that prior to that I didn't know anything about. And it was, uh, it really completely opened up brand new doors that I'd never uh, walked through before that. So maybe, I don't know if you want to translate that. <laughs> okay, so really, the, in short, um, we would just basically say that I had discovered superimposing, that is putting chords on top of other chords to expand the sound of them. You know, if I was sitting in a room with one of you guys 
and I played an A minor chord, an A minor triad, and then somebody else played maybe an E minor triad at the same time, then together that sound would, would, would be something like this. So the idea is that, you know, arpeggios existed way before, you know, when I was young, I used to think Yngwie Malmsteen invented, you know, arpeggios. But what he did is he just sort of figured out a way to play them really fast and really impressive, but he's never really superimposing them. He's playing A minor, the band's playing A minor, and then he's playing more A minor over here. But people for years had been playing arpeggios or notes against chords to get color, to get more color. So basically that, that's what I had discovered, really superimposing chords over other chords and playing individual notes so it sounds more like um, soloing or more like playing lines. So that, that's just, a, I just wanted to kind of summarize my discovery it was really, I'd, 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 I had inadvertently discovered superimposing. Okay, cool. So this is also, um, I guess one of the things about this is that it's not just the arpeggios and the the discovery of superimposing, but it was discover, discovery of this particular format of arpeggio, which is very easy to play, very comfortable, very logical for the fingers, and very easy to, um, I guess, uh, what's the word, uh, to uh, sort of translate into lines, uh, you know, take, use the arpeggio as a skeleton to form more, you know, better sentences with. In other words, if I'm playing over this, I don't just want to go like this. That's pretty boring. Uh, that's a pretty boring thing to do. You can do it once in a while. But, but what you can do is you can take, if you like the sound of that, I mean, first of all, I have to ask myself, why do I like the sound of this? The sound of that arpeggio over this chord is because it's got this B in it, so it's really bringing the whole sound of a minor nine to the to the party, right? The whole thing sounds like that now. And that's because of the notes that I'm using. So I'm using this arpeggio to create that sound. Right. So um, the nice thing about this particular format, I'm going to just go through it slowly because then we can modify these and turn them really easily into licks. So let's say I take, uh, I'll just use the E minor shape for a second. So, e, so all, the, all of the arpeggios have the same format. Actually, I'll just start with G major since that's the key that we're in. So we're gonna roll through the chord scale of G major. I'll play them, it's nice and slow. And a lot of you guys, I already know, you, know, you already know these shapes, but we're gonna do some different things with them. So basically they're all fifth string root based. They all start at the fifth string. There's always two notes on the, on the fifth string, one on the D. So in this case, 10, 14, 12. And then on the G string, we have two again. So 10, 14, 12, 10, or 11, 12. So then one note on the B string, and then two on the high E. So it's two, one, two. So that's the arpeggio. You can actually get the, if you want to go up to the octave. But that's the shape, right? That's the basic format. It's always going to be the same with all the arpeggios. Two notes on the fifth string, one on the D, two on the G, one on the B, and then two, or possibly three, if you want to jump up to the other uh, octave and get that. So that's the format. All of the arpeggios have that. A minor would be the same exact format, slightly different shape. I'll just play it slowly. Same exact format. B minor, same exact thing as A minor. C major, same as the G major. D dominant seventh uh, is the first time we have something different, right? So we finally have a different shape. Everything has been major and minor up to this point. Uh, now we have dominant seventh, which is just like major except we drop that seventh down one fret. So it's the same, it'll feel very, if, you, if you're good at major seventh, it'll feel just the same. So uh, 
dominant seventh. And then another minor. And then minor seven flat five, which is the, is the other one. So we have four total shapes. And this one is like minor, but flat five. So in this case, nine, 12, and then 10 on the next string. Then nine and 11. And then 10. And then four. Depending on what you want to do. So anyway, that's that's all the... That's the whole chord scale. I just played through that in the form of arpeggios. And there's really only four shapes and they're not hard. They're not that difficult compared to a lot of other things. I think that these are easier uh, to use than triad arpeggios because you have more than one note per string. Triad arpeggios often are like, you know, like almost all one note per string. So it's a lot more difficult to control them. And they don't sound as colorful to me. Great. Could you explain the four shapes that you mentioned? Yes. More in detail? Absolutely. So the four okay. shapes would be major, minor, dominant seventh, and then half diminished or minor seven flat five. So major, I'll do them all, all four shapes from one place just so we can see what they look like. Right, so I'll play everything from E just so we can see it. So major for E would go. I'll play it real slow. Major third. That's our fifth. That's our major seventh to the root again. There's our third again. Fifth, five, seven, root. So that's the major shape. Should I do it real slow? Should I do it slower? Real slow? <laughs> So that's major seventh. Um, major, as jazz players would just say major. Rock, rock players would say major seventh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, minor is the same format, but we flatten the third. So we have this, and we flatten the third on the G string. So minor is this in slow motion. Um, again, this, you know, if you don't want to reach up to that, you can you slide up to it. You don't have to play it at all. You can just go. So there's no way to do this. It's, um, it's just the basic shape, right? So. So that's the minor shape. Um, dominant seventh is like the major. First three notes are the same, but the uh, the seventh is no longer major. It's flatted, right? So, so it's a dominant seventh, Do, uh, flat seven with a major third, and then uh, the whole. And I'll just play through that one real slow. That's the major, dominant seventh. And then the last one is the minor seven with a flatted fifth or minor seven flat five. And that's uh, that just looks like this. So. That's minor seven flat five. Once again, slow. So those are the four basic shapes. Okay, so, um, but again, it's, uh, I was playing them diatonically because we, we have to, you know, we have to use the right ones in the right spot if we're gonna play, play stuff that sounds cool. One of the things that's really cool to do if you're, you know, if most of the students that I have are people that have been playing for for a while and they 
they have good chops. They've got a good sense of, they've got good ears. They've got good vibrato and that they're good players, but it's a lot of pentatonics and they're looking to go to the next place. They're looking for something else to do to expand that sound a little bit. And so every time I get with one of these, a new student like that, this is the first thing we do. And almost immediately they can apply this because one of the things that you can do right away is always know that wherever there's a blues box, if you're in the key of A minor, which we've been in, we like that key, we're guitar players. Uh, if we like, if we, wherever that blues box is located, two frets down towards the headstock, you can always play major seventh arpeggio. You can always use that, that shape. And you can always use the minor seventh two frets towards the body of the guitar, right? Does that, does that make sense? Cool. All right. So the next phase, so basically the reason I wanted to point that out is because it's so easy to get to navigate just between those two shapes. I mean, if, if this is new to you guys, to, and so I know that many of you out there are much more advanced, so this is probably really boring, but to guys who are just getting into this or looking for new ideas, one of the very first things you can do is see this G string. <laughs> as like the train tracks, the transportation place that gets you from station to station, right? We have all these different stations. We have A minor, we have E minor, minor seven flat five, uh, B, oh, C, you know, all these different places where we can stop and get off the train tracks. And we have the blues box. So notice like, I can just play regular, normal pentatonic kinds of kinds of lines. Jump down a fret and then consider myself in the middle of this arpeggio. So, same thing with the with the with the other arpeggio. I can I can, you know, blues lick, classic blues lick. Maybe slide up on the G string and descend on E minor, right? Or maybe ascent. Same thing here. So it's just easy. I'm just trying to show you how easy it is to, to work these in because we don't have to always start from the lowest note or the highest note. We can start in the middle and in a way that sort of helps disguise it a little bit. It doesn't sound so um, scholastic, right? It doesn't sound so much like an exercise. So I really enjoy that. These are simple maneuvers. Like if I play this now, play an A note, now I'll play C major seventh arpeggio. And, um, and maybe I'll just do a simple move like this. And then slide into my blues box. So Right, so it's really easy to to just sort of combine them together. I could do the same thing here. I could play E minor ascending this far and then jump right into blues. So I don't know if that's making sense. I'm so um, the very first thing that, so I think that's a great way to start is to just sort of combine those two arpeggios with, um, with blues. I'll just do it a little bit because um, they both of these arpeggios highlight the ninth note of the scale. They both highlight this note, right? So they both give that color. Um, and you could just sort of try things like this. 
Blues descending on a blues scale, then slide up. Maybe I'll de ascend on E minor, and then slide down into the blues box. Here's E minor descending, blues, and another slide descend more with the, with the C major 7. So E minor, blues, C major. So it's just a lot of the same stuff over and over again, but it's a good place to start, I think. Um, so the, other, the, next, the next phase is to try to do this. This is a really fun thing to do. When you get a little bit more comfortable with the arpeggios, or if you're already comfortable with them, try to sort of see these things in two separate tiers, two separate sections. Like we have the lower tier, and then the upper tier. And because the reason I say that is because you can kind of combine different arpeggios together by combining different tiers. So I could do something like this, where I, I start very inside the tonality with like A minor. Very inside sound, very pentatonic. But then I can end by sliding on that, taking the train tracks on that G string, and maybe us, and then completing my idea with the ascend on this arpeggio, which is G major. So, so it gets a little bit more colorful as the lick goes on. This is very inside. And that's a very easy move, right? The fingers don't have a problem with that, really. I could play something like this, where I just give it a little bit of personality, and then walk into the G major. So A minor, little personality, slide into G major upper tier and we get that color because now we're highlighting not just the nine but we're highlighting the sixth or the 13 as well so that's a very colorful arpeggio to use in this context so yeah so this is just a, you know so i'm going to just do a little bit of this where um in slow motion i'll play some ideas uh a minor in my little legato sort of uh, filler and then maybe I'll walk into B minor, right? That's a really nice sound, right? Or I could even play. So basically what I'm doing is I'm, I did, I went, I went B minor, descended on some scales, I'll send it again on A minor, this time dip down into G major. Play some scales, E minor, blues into the C major. So you, it, the possibilities are, you know, you can almost make it up as you go along because this, this little trick with the G string is so convenient that it really doesn't, it's, it's just all this stuff is so much easier than you would think it is. It's, it's really not difficult at all. And it's just a simple way, you know, when, when I started to see the fretboard this way, not only did my guitar playing start to sound better, but it actually got easier to, to because it was compartmentalized in a way where visually it wasn't just a bunch of three note per string scales anymore. It was some very specific shapes that represented very specific sounds. Um, so 
let's get a couple of ideas here that are I call this disguising the arpeggios, right? We don't we don't want to sound like we're just playing arpeggios. But we want to we want all the benefits that the arpeggios offer. Like so I so if I like this sound but I don't want to play an arpeggio, how can I get that sound and utilize the shape but not play an arpeggio exactly? Well, Here's a sim simple idea, with this, especially with this format of our arpeggio. So let's go to E minor. And all I'm going to do is play the E minor um, arpeggio, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this first. I'm going to just go like this. I'm just putting an intro. I just, that's all I did, just simple little three note thing. It could, it could have been anything. It could have been this. But I'm just going to do the simple three note intro. Then I'm going to play the arpeggio. So now we have now the arpeggio. So, so it already takes that blatant arpeggio quality out of it a little bit. Um, I can do the same thing on the G string, right? I'm going to add one note, diatonic note that's not part of the arpeggio, just like we did here. I'm doing the same thing here. And then I'll finish the arpeggio. So there's our midway intro and then the arpeggio. So in slow motion, right? So it's kind of a nice fluid uh, run that doesn't really sound like an arpeggio anymore. However, if we still like the sound of this over this chord, we still get to have that sound. We do the same thing on all the shapes. Minus some flat five. I want to make sure that all makes sense. What I'm saying is that logical or my <laughs> right? So it's so we're just disguising these. We're disguising these ideas. Um, you know, if I did this, you can see what I did here, right? I went E minor with the with the disguise, but this time I shifted to the upper tier of minor seven flat five from the F sharp. So this. This area of the F sharp, I went to after E. So here's E with the disguise. And then however you want to e descend, I could just play the arpeggio. But the idea is this. So we can do that anywhere. C major. I'm just really doing the same thing over and over again, uh, combining lower sections of arpeggios to the upper tier of other arpeggios. And uh, and just creating nice harmony. Um, I'm going to do it to music a little bit. Let me pick a different backing track. So I'm going to just play to a, a, a Latin groove a little bit. I'm going to tr I'm going to start off being very obvious with what I'm doing, and then I'll try to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, and I'm just going to play for a minute because I want to show you. I just I want to show you another idea with these arpeggios that, that's really convenient. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, so you get the idea. You can see me, uh, hopefully you can see me doing what I was talking about earlier, um, hopefully. So the other nice thing about this, uh, this format of arpeggio is that years ago when I would, actually still to this day, when I, a lot of times when I'm, when I'm working with um, students uh, regarding phrasing, the thing that I find a lot of really rock players do a lot, uh, in, rock influence players will do a lot is, they play a lot of things that are very downbeat oriented, right? So things that sound very, uh, you know, uh, predictable a little bit. Like... You know? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's 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 cool sometimes, but it's also cool, in my opinion, to sometimes uh, have things sound a little bit less downbeat oriented, uh, have a little bit of the sort of bebop influence where things don't sound so predictable. So where um, a typical example would be something like this: Let's, we use the classic blues box again, and uh, you know a phrase that a rock. You know, Rock players might play, might be something like this. Right? So if I take that. It's kind of predictable, right? Everything's divisible by four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three. So if I do that to music. It sounds a little bit predictable. It's cool. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's a little bit predictable. If I have a sequence that is um, not divisible by four, like say maybe it's got five notes in it, like maybe something more like this, then I can start to sound a lot more interesting if I'm playing by counting to four, but playing a sequence that's got something like five notes in it. So this has five notes in it. So when I count one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three, then it, it, you know, the, it keeps moving, it keeps moving its position because I get to four before the, before the sequence is over. So if I put that in a sequence going across this blues box, one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two It sounds a lot more interesting. Even if I'm not good at playing things on the upbeats, just by practicing a polyrhythmic sequence, it forces that to happen. So to me, this is a lot more interesting. Than this. So the reason I bring, okay, cool. So now let's take the same concept with these arpeggios. Um, this was something I came up with and it really worked with a lot of students It really did. Like a lot of students who just had a hard time phrasing you know, by, you know, having that displaced sound or having more emphasis on the upbeats, people that had trouble with that, um, this really fixed it when they started to do this next sequence. So this exercise is really fun and it's really helpful and I'll show you how we can put it to use. I'm going to take the E minor seventh arpeggio. I'm just going to take the upper tier. So the third string, the B string and the high E string. And 
I'm going to play a sequence that goes like this. I'll play it real slow so you can see what it is. Okay. So I'm going to play a slow sequence. I'm going to play a sequence slowly. This has seven notes in it, and it's fun to play. It's got some big intervals, and it's got string skipping, and it's, and it's not very difficult. So here's how it goes. So that's the beginning. And then we play this note that we skipped over. And we end with the lowest note and the highest note of that shape. So we, then we'll just play it slow. So if I play that and I hear this as four, if I can, you know. And the idea is that it's sort of like a drumming exercise. We want to, we want to be feeling the pulse of four, but recognizing this, these, the, you know, the shifting of, of the, of these accents. So one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E. So that's the idea. And we can take that a step further. If I take the seventh note of that sequence and I alternate it between say this one and maybe this one, which is on the B string. So these four, these three notes will, I'm going to alternate with the sequence. So you can you can just practice. It's a good exercise, anyways. Um, I'll slow it down a little bit. So that becomes a very trick because if I'm playing along to music, and I was in you know, and I want to start using these arpeggios but not sound so typical, I can really take advantage of this. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that in, um, real quick. So, uh, and I'll show you how to do that in, um, real quick. So, here's a simple idea pentatonic scale. On one string. So, I see that on my train tracks uh, string. And I'm going to play a fifth above each one of these notes. And that's all I'm going to do for now. I'm just going to go. Now I'm going to do the same thing with octaves. Both of those things are really easy to do. Now I'm going to do something that's just as easy but sounds a lot more complicated because I'm going to alternate the octave with the fifth. So I'm going to go. So that's kind of a cool way to sound confusing, even though it's really simple, because I'm just following a pentatonic scale and just alternating um, between the high E string and the B string. So now what happens if we take this previous idea, right? So this is the... Remember, that can be applied to any shape. So here's the minor 7 flat 5 shape, right? With the major 7th shapes, um, a lot of times what I do is instead of playing... That's, this fingering is yeah, it's kind of difficult. They're cumbersome, clumsy. So I change this note to the next note. So in other words, major 7th, if I were going to use that sequence in major 7th shapes... I would use this note. And basically, they all feel that easy. Now, let's say that I have this idea. Typical idea, right? Blues lick, play some typical phrase. Something like that, maybe. Now I'm going to move to a position, either up or down. It could be here. Either one. And maybe I'll play this. 
just because it's, uh, I, I know that it's always going to work, right? A fifth above this pentatonic notes always works. So maybe I'll just do this. And now I'm going to play my sequence. Maybe I'll play two of those with an, an alternate last note. And then I'll and then I'll move to another. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll play an octave and then the next position, then a fifth, and then maybe that lick again. So in other words, I can start to be very spontaneous about where and when I kick into this sequence. Does that make sense what I'm what I'm saying? Yeah, so um so I'm just gonna play a little bit. I'm gonna try to put all these ideas in there and see if a little bit. I'm gonna be I'm not gonna get too crazy, but just enough for you to see these working. And uh let's see what happens. I can't promise anything. It might be a disaster, but we're gonna try. <laughs> So that's just a, a sort of basic idea, not not great, but you can at least get the concept of what I'm what I'm doing, and uh, it really makes for things sounding a lot more interesting than just you know running up and down pentatonics or, or even just playing straight single note uh, you know linear scales because that can sometimes get a little bit old and tired sounding. So cool. So um, one last thing, and this is a, not last thing, but this is another part of the sequential idea and I just want to give you this really slow this is a I don't have tablature but so I'll just play it really slow and uh, I guess if this is a video you can always rewatch it or something but this is a long sequence that's got 32 notes in it and if you learn the sequence it's applicable to all of the shapes and this is why a lot of times when I'm playing if I'm jamming out with one of my guitar player friends um, a lot of times they'll say things to me like geez man you never run out of licks and i'm like in my mind i'm playing the same thing over and over and over again but there the thing is if a sequence is only this long four notes before it starts over again then it's easy to recognize the sequence but if you've got 32 notes in the sequence and it's a random sequence no one notices that you keep playing it over and over again so i'll give you an idea. I'll just show you the sequence. This is just one of many, but this is one that I use a lot. So I'm going to start, I'm going to use the E minor shape again, and I'm going to just play it slowly. So here we go. It starts with a triad, minor triad, and then uh, we repeat the first two notes and we go right to the minor seven. So. Skip over that D string. So. And then we're going to play this. This is a straight arpeggio, linear, straight up from G to G, right? So, so here's what we have so far. This is what we have so far. So one E and a two E and a three E and a four. So that's what's next. 
So let me just play that in with my foot tap a little bit. Yeah, they, they... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so let's. Uh, here's what we have so far. So the next move after this is this. So that's the exercise that we did earlier. That's the seven note sequence that comes right after that. So let's see what that sounds like. So it's kind of cool. And I'm actually going to play that twice. The second time using the B string version of the seventh tone instead of this instead of the tenth fret of the high E. So, so that here's what we have so far. And then we're almost done. I'm gonna play this note, the E note or the D note, and then skip over the D string. I'm going to play this G and then this right afterwards. So, so it's a little confusing. Let me just play it from here. So one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a two E. So, so that, that's just a, a long random sounding sequence with a lot of intervallic interplay, but it's fun when, again, when you're jamming over stuff like this. So you get the idea. Very cool. So at this point, let me, uh, if any of you guys have any questions, anybody wants to uh, ask me anything, thank you so much. Okay, we do have one question here for you. Um, here says, um, what about hybrid picking? Uh, how do you uh, recommend to start this technique? Good question. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a quick little history of my, my, uh, my introduction to it. So back in the early 90s, um, right after I got my record deal with Mike Varney, a guy by the name of Michael Lee Ferkins got a record deal. And he uh, he's a great, amazing guitar player. And when I heard him for the first time, I heard him over the phone because Mike Varney likes to play stuff over the phone for you. And um, and I thought to myself, so, so he's a slide guitar. He sounded like a slide guitar player, but he had these really cool licks with his with the slide. And then Mike Varney revealed to me that he doesn't use a slide at all. He's just using a lot of whammy bars and a lot of finger, you know, fingers and stuff like that. 
around the same time, there was a guitar player, and there still is one of my favorite guitar players, a guy named Brett Garsid from Australia. And um, he uses the pick along with these other fingers on his uh, right hand. And I loved a lot of the stuff that he was doing. And then when I did, I did an album with Richie Kotzen called Tilt. And we never got together for that album. So um, eventually we got together on the East Coast to do a photo shoot after, the, after we, all the recordings were done. And I remember I asked him about one of the licks on the album that I wrote. I don't remember what it was, but I said, how do you play this? I'd like to see you play it in front of me. And when he started playing, he started using these fingers. So at that point, I thought to myself, everybody's starting to do this. I better, I better get on board because I wasn't doing any hybrid picking back then. So I really just started to, I didn't really have a system. I just started to work on things. And the main thing that I did was, that I think the, probably the first thing I did was I said to myself, um, a typical, say, legato run like this, something like that, right? So that's a typical way that I used to play it. So I just started to say to myself, anything that's an upstroke, I would start to just replace it with, with, uh, with my finger. So basically when I do runs like that, I'm playing everything that, uh, this, this sequence happens a lot with my playing where you, that, that move always happens, right? That's always going on. And, but it's going on fast. So it's happening, you know, so anytime I have that last note before I leave that string, that I make that a pluck or a, enough a, a hybrid pick. So that's probably where I started, and uh, I I just it I didn't really have a I didn't really have an exercise. I just started to become a little bit more aware of. Um, you know, just sort of saying to myself, don't use an upstroke there, use a pluck, use a, use your finger. Um, so that's one place to start. Another place was, oh, my pleasure. I need a little text to everybody. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I can't answer everyone. But, you know. Yeah, that's, that is hybrid too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, the other thing that I do a lot, and this helped with hybrid picking was, I do this weird thing, um, I've done it for years where um, I, I, I bar a bar strings and then get a sequence. It's a four note sequence or it's based on a four note sequence where I might have something like this, right? Right. So I'm, you can see I'm hybrid picking that. I didn't used to, but to get the sequence like this. So it used to be this with a pick. That's okay, but I found that when I switched that upstroke to uh, to my finger, it got clearer and it got a little bit faster. So um, we always like to be faster, us guitar players. So that that was a that particular exercise um, was really helpful because it actually I was already comfortable with with that type of thing, but when the when the second finger got got in there, it's it actually sounded better. I thought you know even I I've, I've been doing those things for years. <laughs> So I, I just, I don't know. So those two things helped a lot. Uh, today, and then, uh, it, it is actually a really good question because when I originally recorded a song, I did a song years ago called Jumpstart. And when I originally recorded that, I wasn't hybrid picking at all. I was doing this. And it was, and I remember, uh, I remember that. I hybrid pick, so I have to do this now. 
I don't remember how I could have done that without hybrid picking. So uh, again, you could take maybe the exercise that we did earlier and every single note that's on that's not on the G string, every single note that's not here, make it a pluck. So I mean, so that's that's another way that you might want to practice that. Greg. Yes. Do you use an, an, an special treatment for your nails or it is just your nails? No, I don't use, uh, in fact, I don't really use the nail that much. It's more, uh, it's more the finger, just the fingertip. So uh, that, that's my question. It's more finger than, than nail, right? I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is, it definitely is. So, so yeah, are you like kind of uh, muting a little bit the string or, yep. I think, I think so, because um, when I don't do it, when I do things like this, I don't know, it's, it feels like it, it gets clearer when I pluck. So yeah. I, think I, I think I am muting a little bit. Yep, I think so, yeah. I, yeah. Hear, I, I hear that, yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you but, very much. Well, you, you know, technically we have I'm sorry to say that, but we have just two minutes, you know. Okay, so. well, fine. <laughs> Do one more question. Yeah, right. I don't know if my team have the same opinion like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I want to say that thank you all so much for, for, for coming. It's really uh, been a pleasure. And um, I know there's a lot of great guitar players out there, so I hope I'm not uh, boring you to, to death with this stuff. But uh, hopefully it's been helpful or for sure, for sure. I didn't know anything about the, the, the shapes that you mentioned, you know. And I think it's very, very useful. And it's not easy because when I, you know, some people say that, you know, that when they are watching at you, it looks like playing guitar is pretty easy, you know, but yeah. it's not. <laughs> that, that's an illusion, trust me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it takes it, time it, and hard work, oh yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, it it is interesting because I, I, sometimes I'll see myself playing it out, and it looks like it. I remember like that was really difficult. It doesn't look like I'm struggling, but it, but but I remember playing it, and I'll I'll think, well, wow, if if people only knew that I wasn't I wasn't really having a good time right there. In and okay, Greg, I we don't want to you know to extend. Uh, I don't know if uh, if you wanted to share your sites or maybe your next tour or, or whatever you want to we we would love to have you in my in our region you know very soon I would, I would love to come down there i want to come back uh, down there so badly I, actually right before all this stuff happened with covid we were working out a th south american tour i know in colombia yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i remember that yeah i remember yeah i i know the guy that was supposed to open for you in colombia and uh, Tom Abela, he was that guy, yeah. And the people in Colombia, uh, the promoters and everything. That, but you know, let's see if you know very soon you can uh, resume that tour, you know, and have you in 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 Mexico and the whole South America, you know, very soon. I I hope so. I, I really hope so. That would be fantastic. Um... I, yeah, I look forward to it. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll definitely keep you posted. I'll let you know. I have an album coming out this year. I have a book coming out this year. And um, and hopefully, I'll finally have some of my instructional video content up. I don't know if that's going to come out this year. And we're not, we don't have a tour lined up because I don't, I don't know what's going on still. My U.S. tour is set for next year in August. Um, there's some talk about possibly doing some stuff in Europe. Uh, in the beginning of next year, but I really don't know. It's very hard to make plans with all these things happening in the world that are so crazy right now. Thank you very much, Greg. I Thank really appreciate it. Yeah, we learn a lot from you and uh, great. yeah, you have a, an amazing spirit, you know, uh, God bless you. God bless Thank your you your family, keep you in, in good health always and hope to see you soon. 
Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. You guys have been great. And uh, thanks to Diodario and everybody involved in this. So, uh, sí, muchas gracias a toda la gente de Dario. Eh, y, y bueno, espera verlos pronto. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye.